The next section is on the augmented Lagrangian method, which, which basically is an improvement on the penalty uh, method. Specifically, it's a method that has actually all the benefits of the penalty method, which is to say it, it kind of works, or at least as a heuristic, it works. Um, but it doesn't require that parameter mu uh, to become infinitely large before you get a good solution. So that's actually, and in practice, it also actually works better. Okay, so uh, as I said, uh, drawback of the penalty method is that mu, uh, this, this penalty parameter mu k increases rapidly, and it has to get big to drive g of x to zero. Um, and what happens is when you do that, the nonlinear least squares subproblem becomes harder to solve. Um, and then it says that, you know, for, we observe that for very large mu k, Lemberg mark bar can either take a large number of iterations or fail. Uh, by fail, it just means as a practical matter, it just takes too long and, and just doesn't work. So to correct that, we're going to show a method that is actually, um, actually just a minor modification of the penalty method um, that keeps a different, keeps a, another uh, vector uh, around um, and updates it in a different way. And, and it actually doesn't suffer from that, um, that, that drawback of the uh, penalty method. So here's what it is. Um, it's this, the so-called, uh, and this is pretty standard optimization stuff. You may see this um, in your later studies. You might not too, um, but it is standard in, in optimization. So the so-called augmented Lagrangian is this. Um, it is going to be the original Lagrangian um, plus mu times g of x squared. Um, now, uh, that's equal to norm f of x squared plus g of x transpose z. This is the uh, Lagrange multiplier term. And that's another term. And you might even say it's gratuitous, this other term. Um, I'll tell you why. Because if you're feasible, g of x is zero. So, like, this thing is zero. So, um, you could think of the augmented Lagrangian as the Lagrangian of this. This is an equivalent problem to the original problem, right? The original problem doesn't have this term. But it's a bit silly because anything feasible for the original problem, this term goes away. So what that says is this problem is equivalent to the original problem. I mean, it's got the same set of minimizers. If, if, if x is a solution of this one, it's a solution of the other one. If it's a solution of this one, it's a solution of the other one. So it, it just goes back and forth. Now you might add, like, why would you do this? And how would adding this extra term help? Um, shockingly, it does. <coughs> Oh, I should say that um, this is the, when you say augmenting the Lagrangian, this is the Lagrangian, and that's the augmented term. Okay. Um, now, when you minimize the, uh, well, okay, I, we, first, first we're going to look at some equivalent expressions for the augmented uh, Lagrangian, right? So, um, this is what it is, right? That's that augmenting term, which seems like a silly term because that term is zero for any feasible point. Um, so what we can do, though, is actually move some stuff. I mean, you see a, a norm g of x, you know, squared here and so on. And we can simply move some stuff in and out. Um, and here's what we're going to do. Um, it's equal to, we're going to actually rewrite this this way. If you just simply expand this, um, and then it, you're going to get this plus that. You can just verify it by expanding the norm squared. Um, but this says that this augmented Lagrangian is going to look like this. It's actually going to look like the norm squared. It's going to look like a nonlinear least squares objective. That's this first part. Um, and then minus a weird term that depends on z. Okay. Um, now let me make a couple of comments. Oh, first of all, it reduces absolutely correctly to the to the nonlinear, uh, to the penalty method, right? When I take z equals zero, this just reduces to the penalty method. I think you see that um, because that's zero. And over here, this is just the, it, it's, it's actually, it's, it's the stacked um, norm squared expression for the objective. Um, now I can minimize, uh, if I fix mu and z, I can minimize this Lagrangian over x well, because I just minimized this. And notice it's very close to what we were doing for the penalty method. There's only this one little extra term, right? So this is this little magic term that we're going to add to the second component. It's the component uh, that corresponds to feasibility. And instead of just set, making this zero, we're going to have this very cleverly chosen thing 
uh, here. Now, I haven't said what z is yet, but we're going we're gonna to decide what z should be shortly. So that we're going to figure out from the optimality conditions. So um, the minimizer of the augmented Lagrangian, so if, in other words, if I minimize this thing, uh, any, or a solution of this, right, this thing, if I minimize that over x, the optimality condition for that is that is this is if you work it out it's it's exactly this it's dg at uh, two times uh, the derivative of f at x transpose f of x and so on um, and here you get the two mu g plus z equals zero so what we're going to do is we're going to define z tilde to be z plus two mu g of x tilde um, then we can write this big thing up here as this. Um, Wow, that's awesome, because that is actually this first equation, okay? Um, and what that shows is that we have a similar thing with this augmented Lagrangian um, as we do with the penalty method. In other words, that with this choice of z, here it is, this is z tilde, uh, it says that, that the first condition that we need for optimality just holds automatically. And it's only the second, it's just feasibility we need. So once you're close enough to feasible, you quit. Okay, um, and what this says is that if, if g of x tilde is not small, it suggests that z tilde is a very good update. That's this one for z. Um, and that's, that actually describes the augmented Lagrangian method. So here's the way it works. Um, you set the next x to be the approximate minimizer of this expression. Now that that actually is minimizing the augmented Lagrangian. So the first step is you, you simply minimize the augmented Lagrangian. Um, oh, with the previous value of zk. Um, and you use Levenberg Marquardt starting from the initial point xk. Now you do a multiplier update and you simply use this formula right here, right? So, and that multiplier update, this one, is the one that guarantees that along the, as this algorithm runs, the first optimality condition of the two just always holds. Um, then we do a, uh, a penalty uh, parameter update. Now, in the uh, penalty method, what you do is you increase mu every single time. You have to increase mu, otherwise you're not going to drive g to be zero. Um, here, though, you don't. Um, if, for example, uh, the, the, this is a measure of how feasible you are. I should say how infeasible you are, right? So this says, if you have made substantial progress in making it less feasible, um, you, uh, you just keep the current mu. It's fine, okay? If that's not the case, if you haven't made substantial progress, substantial progress, we arbitrarily defined it to be dividing the, the infeasibility, resi the residual, by a factor of four. If you don't, then you crank up mu. Uh, but notice that you have this thing, right? That if uh, that that that's that's there, that you don't increase it if if you've are, if you've automatically made progress towards uh, driving the residual to zero. Um, so the idea here is that mu is increased only when needed, and therefore it's more slow than in the penalty method. Um, and you simply continue until g of x k is uh, sufficiently small. That's that is the method. Um, okay, so. Uh, let's see how it works on that same example as we looked at before. Um, so here what happens is, um, is actually pretty amazing. <coughs> on the first step, we start with mu equals 1, z1 equals 0. We get this point. It turned out um, we did not make prog uh, enough progress, so we bump mu to 2. Um, and then we get this point. Um, well, uh, on the next one, uh, that also did not make sufficient progress. Sufficient progress meant, meant that we the norm of g was reduced by a factor of four. And I mean, that was just a choice that we made. Um, so here, now, it, uh, at, ap after it goes to four, you calculate something. And you can see right now on the third step, you're, you're, you're very close to feasible. So at that point, you're close enough to feasible that, in fact, you keep mu at four. Um, and you do just a couple more iterations, and you've really got a very good solution here in... I guess this is uh, six steps. So, um, so this appears, appears, at least on this baby example, to work better than the so-called penalty method. Okay? And so now this looks like this. Um, <coughs> it, uh, it takes us down to 10 to the minus 4 uh, pretty quickly. Again, these are the two components of, of this. After the first step, uh, which also takes like 50-odd iterations, um, 
the the sec the second the first the first optimality condition is satisfied, and now we just wait for feasibility. It looks like that. Um, here's what's very cool is if you look at the penalty parameter, um, the other one went up to ten thousand. Um, here it goes up to four and stops. Um, so that is actually the idea behind the augmented Lagrangian method. Yeah. Um, oh, I should say that um, you know there's whole courses on. On, on solving, you know, so-called nonlinear optimization problems. And maybe you'll take one, maybe you won't. Um, the truth is most, norm most normal people do not need to know the details of all these algorithms. Most normal people access these by software packages that implement things like levenberg marquardt or other algorithms. Um, still, it's good for you to know, uh, it's good for you to know, like, what's inside some of these packages. Um, and these are not so bad that you couldn't, uh, you, you couldn't write them yourself. I mean, these are, these are pretty straightforward. We're going to finish with uh, one example, um, just to show what it is. And it is a simple model of a car. Um, and so it's uh, what we're, we're going to do is, it, so let me, let me give the model. So um, the model is, here's a picture of the car uh, in, in, I guess, in, in blue uh, uh, schematic here. Um, and you can see here the steering angle, that's theta. So, sorry, that's not theta. Theta is the orientation of the vehicle, right? So what we'll do is we'll say um, P is the position, say, of the center of the car. Um, S of T is the speed of the vehicle. Um, so that's the speed. Uh, and then phi of T is the steering angle. The steering angle is defined as the angle of the front wheels uh, compared to the orientation of the car. So that's, that's illustrated here. And the orientation of the car is the angle of the car relative to, I would say horizontal, but cars don't drive up and down. So whatever we decided to this axis to be, maybe that's uh, due, let's say that that's due east or something, right? So it's the number of degrees north uh, compared to a due east heading. Okay, so, and here's the model. Um, and it's usually given in a, in a, a continuous time, uh, in, you know, continuous time way to say it. And... It's this. Uh, let's see if we can even try to figure this out. So, um, so dp1 means how far does the car go in 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 sort of in this direction? Uh, what's its speed? And that's going to be its speed, which is a scalar, a positive scalar, which is s of t. Uh, sorry, doesn't have to be positive. S can be negative. Um, that corresponds to the car uh, backing up. So s can be negative. My apologies. Okay, um, times cosine theta of t. Make that makes sense. <coughs> dp2 dt is s of t the speed times sine theta of t theta is the is the uh, vehicle uh, orientation um, and then you have this one uh, d theta dt that is the change in orientation is equal to s of t that's the speed <coughs> divided by l l is the length of the wheelbase um, times the tangent of phi of t so tangent of the steering angle okay uh, this has got a name. <coughs> I think this is called the Dubin's model of a car, uh, but don't don't quote me on that. It doesn't matter. It's a si very simple uh, model of car motion. Okay, and what we'll do is we'll look at a problem where your job is to choose the speed and steering angle as a function of time. <coughs> okay, so we're going to discretize it, um, and we'll do that by taking a small time interval h. And we'll simply say that the new position is the current position plus h times the velocity or the, the derivative uh, at the previous time step. And so this is very common. Um, this <coughs> simple discretization method is called uh, so-called forward Euler, Euler after the famous mathematician Euler. Um, if you take a course on differential equations and numerical uh, treatment of them, you'll find out that this is an incredibly unsophisticated uh, discretization, and there are way better ones. Nevertheless, this one is just fine. It's just, it, and it's the one that's kind of the most obvious. Um, so we'll define an input vector, u. <clears throat> it's going to have two components, um, but at each time step, and it's going to be s of kh, the speed, uh, and the steering angle. <coughs> and we'll make a state vector. We'll call that xk. It's going to be your two positions and your orientation. So that's the state of the car. And then the discretized model looks like this. xk plus 1, the new state, is f of xk uk. And f of xk uk is this, uh, this function uh, here. 
Um, that's a complicated function from R3 to R3. Um, well, actually, sorry, XK is R3. It's actually from R5 to R3 because that's three vectors and that's two. So this tells you how your next position and your next orientation depends on how you set the steering angle and what speed you choose for at, at that time. Okay, now we'll look at a control problem. Uh, and the problem is to move the car from a given initial uh, to a desired final position and orientation. So, um, and we also want a small and slowly varying input sequence, right? So we don't want gigantic speeds and things like that. We also don't want the, the speed or the steering angle to change abruptly, so we want that smooth. And so we'll make this a constrained nonlinear least squares problem. Um, we're going to uh, minimize the sum of the norms of u squared uh, plus gamma times a smoothness constraint on, on, uh, on u. Uh, this is a, actually, this is nice. That's, uh, that's, this thing is completely, uh, that, that is at least linear least squares or something like that. Um, and now we have the constraints, which are not linear. And they are, <coughs> we, we insist uh, that uh, the final state, uh, that the final one has to equal this thing. And we would have uh, here f of, this says, this is the state equation. Right. This says that xk plus 1 is f of xk uk. Um, and here, uh, we're starting from... Uh, this uh, doesn't look right. This should say that the initial, the initial state should be x init. Right. That's, I suspect what that is supposed to say. So that should be x uh, init equals um, and then x1. Um, I suspect. I'm not, not quite sure what that is. Okay, so if we run the augmented Lagrangian method, um, it actually comes up with a with, with a um, with a trajectory, um, and it's a pretty sophisticated uh, trajectory. Um, and here we're given we're, we're giving you various things. I think in all of these, the initial state um, is maybe zero. Oh, maybe maybe that was this. Uh, 0 and u1. I'm not sure what that's about. But um, here, x1, perhaps the initial state is, is, is just um, here, uh, at, at starting from 0. Okay? Um, so here, see if we can figure that out. Yeah, so it looks like you start here, right? And then uh, this is getting you, you have to get over to, get over to here, and you do, right? Because the final state is 0, 1, 0. Um, and that means that your your uh, orientation uh, is still uh, is still the same. It's zero. It's looking due east, um, and your position goes from zero zero to zero one, which is right here. Um, I'm pretty sure, by the way, this involves backing up. We'll we'll check if that's the case in this one. Um, here's for another final condition. This is where you're here. You start here, pointing that direction, and what you want to do is you want to be up here. You want to be up at the same position, but you want to be pointed due north. Um, and that will be this one. And that one, and that one, you take you take off driving, well, in in forward, not reverse. And you simply go up up to there, and you can do that. Um, here's a crazy one. If I say x final is zero point five, and zero, it means you want to be here. And the trajectory found is actually kind of cool. What it does is it it goes back, it goes in reverse, it backs up, slows down, stops, then comes out in forward. <laughs> Uh, and ends up where it's supposed to be. So that's a pretty fancy driving maneuver, if you don't mind my saying so. And it's kind of crazy that this, just running the augmented Lagrangian thing, finds that. Um, here's another one where uh, you start here, and you want to end up at the point 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and minus pi over 2. And so that means uh, pointed down this way. And so the way you do that is you drive forward here, you stop, and then you simply back up along here. So these are pretty crazy trajectories, right? Um, so, oh, by the way, I should add that um, people do find trajectories for cars, um, some you know, this way or ways that look like this. Um, so this is done for you know, sort of self-driving cars, auto parking, all sorts of other crazy stuff. They do something that's equivalent to this. Uh, it's actually probably pretty close to just this. So here are the inputs for these four. We can take one and try to figure it out. Um, let's let's take this last one here. 
So this says that over your 50 steps or so, um, you start with a, some speed, kind of keep up that speed, and then sort of in the middle, the speed goes down to zero, and then negative speed means you've gone into reverse, and so on. And then the steering angle should look like this. It's zero, and you, you turn hard to the, I suppose that's the right. Um, you would turn the steering wheel to the right, hardest here, then right at that point when you, when you go through zero velocity, your steering wheel is straight, then you turn it the other way to the left, and that's this thing. And let's see if that kind of makes sense for this one. And I think it does, because what it is is you drive, you drive straight here, you slow down, you stop there. So you've turned the wheel to the right. Uh, now, right at the end, your wheel is straight. It's, uh, it's at zero. Then you start negative speed, which means you back. this is backing up. And when you back up here, uh, you're, uh, you're turning the wheel, this is to the left, in order to back up. And... Sure enough, that is exactly what happens here, right? So it's pretty cool. I mean, that 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 just this dumb algorithm can can uh, can find you know pretty sophisticated um, uh, trajectories and maneuvers uh, for for our car. Um, so it's just to show that the stuff we've put together, it's it's not simple, it's not obvious. Um, I mean, if you didn't know any of this, this would be an insuperable. Pro I mean, this how would you make a? Pro what would you do? I, I didn't even know how you would do this if someone said. Oh, make me something that auto parks a car or something like this, where would you begin? And the answer is this is a pretty important component uh, of it.